Funding for the Lazy Bedhead channel was provided by viewers like you. Thank you. This video is sponsored by Atlas VPN. When I go to dinner at a fancy restaurant, you know who I don't want as my blind date? My internet service provider. Seriously? Uh, come on, you can't get mad at me. You're the one who brought a phone. Yeah, you know what? You're ridiculous. Was it something I said? Having an internet service provider is like having a stalker. <laughs> Actually, I learned that after a first date, it's very rude not to walk the lady back home to her house. By the way, your kitchen is nasty. You need to do your dishes. You know what? Would you, would you get out of here? Not like a social media stalker or an IRL stalker, but the type of stalker that knows your search history, sells that search history to multimedia companies who will then harass you with ads. You know what? I... I can't put up with this anymore. There's got to be a better way. Well, there is. It's Atlas VPN. Join the over 6 million users who are protecting their phones, computers, tablets, and even their TVs from hackers, data brokers, and scammers with the most affordable VPN service available. A VPN is a virtual private network that protects your online search history, garners you access to region block content on your streaming services such as on Netflix and Hulu, saves you money whilst online shopping, and stops malware and malicious ad links from harming your devices. Atlas VPN wants to offer my audience their premium plan for six months for less than $2 a month. Their premium subscription will unblock more streaming platforms and more server locations. This is all part of their limited Black Friday deal and you're not gonna wanna miss it because this super affordable VPN just got even more affordable. What I enjoy most about Atlas VPN is how easy it is to set up on all of my devices. And it's also super affordable, which I love. But if you guys try out Atlas VPN and you're not satisfied, Atlas provides a 30-day money-back guarantee. Protect your privacy and get the many benefits of Atlas VPN for a ridiculously low price. Click the link in the video description or scan the QR code for this exclusive offer. Thank you so much to Atlas VPN for sponsoring today's video. And now back to your regularly scheduled whatever. Well, I'm doing the thing. You know, I was going to have like a more elaborate uh, cough play like I did for my last uh, Five Nights at Freddy's video. Um, but I feel like this does the trick, right? This kind of and gets the point across, you know, because bear. Before we begin, I would like to preface this video by saying... Thank you all for getting my last video regarding Five Nights at Freddy's up to 100,000 views. Yeah! Hey, I haven't had uh, that many views of a video since the last time I made a video on Onision. Oh my god! Now that my Five Nights at Freddy's content has proven more successful than literally anything else on this channel, I will now proceed to do nothing but FNAF videos until the day I die. Thanks for watching! Hello! 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 Uh... Well, if you're hearing this, then chances are you've made a very poor career choice. The Five Nights at Freddy's fanverse is what keeps these games alive. There's an entire community based around talking about and creating fan games and creating fan verses. And instead of taking issue with the fan community who just copies off his homework over and over and over and over and over and over, Scott Cawthon instead decided to help this growing community by creating a project where games and developers could strive to be as successful as Scott. Recognizing the community and paying homage to the fans is what keeps games like 
Half-Life or Team Fortress still alive, we still see stuff like Gary's Mod custom maps, SCP games, and stuff coming from Gbot enthusiasts to this day. And not only do we still see TF2 animations and memes, but the game is still being updated, letting the community make and vote on in-game items, recognizing the community instead of manhandling copyright, suing other content creators, and completely deleting entire back catalogs of games. Only then to be upset when the community preserves them through emulation is what keeps fans coming back to give their filthy, greasy money for these overpriced products. Unless, of course, you're a fan of Nintendo, in which case you just had a humiliation fetish. And uh, speaking of humiliation fetish, <laughs> Fortnite's a pretty... Okay, uh, FNAF doesn't have anything to do with that. It was just a funny transition. <laughs> really, um... Knocks you out of your socks there, doesn't it? But Five Nights at Freddy's has been there for the fans from the jump. As an indie game, not only FNAF wouldn't have much of an industry reach, like say a AAA game or development team or company. Unless, of course, the fans hype the shit out of it. And who oh boy did they? And now this little indie game is being treated like a AAA title. And what better way to cherish this glory than sharing the same opportunity with the fanbase that made it all possible. But sometimes this opportunity will encourage some really desperate people. Some really insistent people who want to be treated like the big dogs, but end up falling short on the fault of their own hubris or ignorance. Today's video is gonna be a weird one, but it's not because of any weird plot twist or dark underbellies that lie beneath the surface of this thing. It's just the fact that this thing exists at all and now haunts me in my dreams because it's all I've been thinking about. Ladies and gents, this is the return to Freddy's. The original FNAF fan game. <laughs> All right. Picture this. The year is 2014, and this neat little game is going around about animal robots killing folks at a Chuck E. Cheese knockoff restaurant. You also uh, probably watched uh, Markiplier's Let's Play because you were too scared to play the game for yourself. And just when you thought, oh, wow, this game actually seems pretty neat. Literally, a sequel is made just three months after the first one. I swear, Scott Cawthon used to pump this shit out faster than the Saw movies. So it's the year 2014 still, and this neat little sequel game is going around about animal robots and two small children uh, killing folks in a Chuck E. Cheese knockoff restaurant. You also uh, probably watched uh, Markiplier's Let's Play because you were too scared to play the game. And just when you thought, oh, well, that sequel game was kind of crazy, Oh, wait, oh, shit, oh, fuck. So then after you play those first two games, Rainier goes around that another game is gonna be made for the series, making it a trilogy. And since you liked the first two so much, you're kinda hyped at this point. But then like a month goes by and FNAF 3 comes out on December 23rd, 2014. Now since the first two games came out so close to each other, you're pretty much used to this by now. These games are point and click games. I mean, it's not like they're that hard to make. Like what, you just gotta get like a panorama background to get stuff to click on? I mean, theoretically, you could make a new game every single month and milk the cash cow quicker than a tea spill YouTuber. But even so, something still doesn't feel quite right, but you don't know exactly what it is. I mean, the official box art does have like an actual mascot on the front, so maybe this is legit. You know, maybe I'm just thinking about it too hard. Let me let me boot up the game and uh, let's play it for ourselves. Uh, oh, oh, uh, oh, hey, uh, why are you staying here? Don't you have more important things in your life to do? No, anyways, I apologize for what happened three nights ago. I thought they, well, well, he was after me. Probably not. Um, so what the fuck? Okay, so you know those movies that you find 
in the bargain bins next to the shelves with the actual movies that you see at the, the grocery store. And those movies in the bin are usually direct copies or loosely inspired off of real movies. Well, the first return to Freddy's in basically a bargain bin video game. Originally titled Five Nights at Freddy's 3, the very first return to Freddy's confused the hell out of literally everyone. Released December 23rd, 2014, just a month after the second game and before the third official FNAF game was even announced, this was made before the conception of the actual third installment of Five Nights at Freddy's. The developer just jumped on it quicker because he saw how popular the franchise was. And he knew he had to jump on that shit so fucking fast. So a really brilliant idea was this to take already existing game assets from two established titles and edit them into one game. And capitalize off of a concept of a FNAF threequel before Scott Cawthon could get to it. Well, let me introduce you to Tyler Allstrom. Hey guys, it's me. Um, so I've said I would make this video a while ago and I haven't uploaded it for quite a while. And I'm going to explain it why for people who haven't seen my Twitter. Tyler Armstrong is a pretty interesting guy, all things considered. I mean, uh, sure, he made up an app shovelware game that's a blatant ripoff, but he's actually got a long history of doing shit before this. Born in Odessa, Texas, Tyler Armstrong was practically raised off of video games, picking up the PlayStation 2 at only three years old. My first ever gaming console was when I was three. It was the PlayStation 2. And first, and the first ever games I played was Crash 1, Crash Cortex Strikes Back, Crash Warped, Crash the Wrath of Cortex, and one of my personal favorites, iNinja. On May 13th of 2003, my brother Andrew was born. On November 5th of 2004, my brother Sean was born. I got to play on my first computer, which was my dad's PC when I was four. Uh, Bejeweled was always my favorite game I'd play on his lap. Alstrom and his younger brothers would find camaraderie in playing video games, which only advanced when his father bought their first computer and started playing games like Bejeweled. When Tyler was 10 years old, his father was arrested for money smuggling and fraud from Mexico to Texas to Wisconsin. They broke the news to me that my dad had been arrested during work at City Hall for smuggling and hiding cash from Mexico to Texas to Wisconsin. In other words, being a fraud. I bursted into tears seeing how long they'd put him in prison, and it was only originally for 20 to 30 years, but then pushed down to only seven years. I felt so angry at him for being lied to and throughout my, my life and could never forgive him for both how he treated me and for not being able to trust him anymore. During that turbulent year of living without his dad, Tyler picked up game development on the original Game Maker 1999 and would code separate Mario and Smash Bros games. Before FNAF was even a thing, the biggest horror character of the time were from websites like Something Awful and Creepypasta, the latter of which would share a common name. The Slenderman. Slenderman was Tyler's introduction to horror games, along with Amnesia the Dark Descent. In the year 2012, Tyler was in middle school. He only really had one friend he could rely on at the time and was questioning his sexuality. My great grandpa had passed away in his sleep. He was the only best friend that I had at the time, and he'd always call me his main man. According to my mom, he said he always felt like I was going to be gay. I had a hard time making friends with guys because of the feelings I had towards them. I didn't have those feelings towards girls at all, so it was easier for me to become friends with girls. Plus, it made me learn more about myself that I didn't even know about, and I became really shy and feminine in school. Uh, when it came to things like not being man enough or tough enough, my dad would always slap me and call me a sissy for being feminine and fragile. Uh, then a day later, quote-unquote apologizing by purchasing a gift, expensive or not. But this would always be a loop, and gifts being purchased felt more like an excuse to shove things under the rug rather than being a genuine apology. But at the time, I thought that was what fatherly love was like. And with him saying, and I quote, I only hit you because I love you. I went to middle school, and it was nerve-wracking. I only made one friend. His name was Jesus. During that same year i was experiencing some attraction towards jesus since i was gay for pretty much all my life and had feelings for him i came out to him and talked about my sexuality telling him i had feelings for him and hope he'd understand the next day kids gave me a strange look and it made me feel very uncomfortable 
it wasn't until later that a friend of mine came up to me and sat beside me during lunch and asked if I was gay. I said yes and asked who told him. Uh, he then responded with something I didn't want to hear. The school knows because Jesus told people and it spread like a virus and it got to the point the principal and the teachers found out and I was later called into the principal's office. The principal asked if I was alright and told me it wasn't normal for me to have these sort of attractions and as soon as my mom arrived to the, to the principal's office uh, they sat her down and discussed a possible solution to all of this was to take me to therapy. My mom of course was disgusted of how homophobic the entire school was and got into a massive fight with the principal. So on top of Tyler struggling with suicidal thoughts and ideation, I, uh, I'd imagine from being out in, in Odessa, Texas, gay development would be such an integral part of Tyler's comfort and self-care growing up. Video games was Tyler's escape from his depression, and making them gave him a sense of purpose. And I tell you all of this because despite the long history of the Return to Freddy series and its run-ins with controversy, Tyler overall isn't a terrible person, at least from what I've come to understand. He was only a kid, he was 14 at the time when he conjured up this entire world and made this whole series. And at 14 years old, what he was able to make on a technical and game development level is kind of impressive, honestly. I mean, obviously it doesn't start off impressive, but later when Tyler does try in this story to develop everything by scratch and doesn't use pre-existing characters and environments, I feel like what he's achieved is not only one of the first FNAF fan games ever to exist, but in turn, one of the first fan universes ever to exist. Everything we're going to talk about with this series was made by a child initially, and I don't want to document and retell this story to hold Tyler up to the cinders for things he made or said 10 years ago. I mean, he's removed himself completely from the internet due to personal reasons, and I hope nothing but the best. And Tyler, if you are watching this, I hope that you do at least enjoy a look down memory lane. And hopefully this video serves as a highlight of your development career. It's gonna be cringy, it's gonna infringe copyright, but it's gonna be fun, I promise. And whatever jokes or criticisms I had for the series, it's not gonna be like a personal attack on you, I promise. I'm just a bit of a, of, of a joke sort of gaffer, you know? I like to entertain folks with uh, topics that interest me. And man, did this one do the trick because it's fucking wild. And because I'm so oddly fascinated by this, I encourage everyone to please don't go harass Tyler. Instead, we should all humbly enjoy the fruits of his labor and be amazed as this whole saga unfolds. So now that I said that, I can make fun of this thing. <laughs> Five Nights at Freddy's 3, renamed to The Return to Freddy's, is essentially just Scott's pre-existing characters and settings meshed into one game. When the game was first launched to Game Jolt, a lot of people confused this as an official title of Scott's game franchise. Within the first week of this game's release, it already stirred up some controversy with Scott Cawthon himself, issuing a request to remove the Game Jolt page entirely. I then, get a, I then get an email from Scott Cawthon himself saying that I needed to remove the game from Game Jolt because he's been getting reports that it was an exact pirated copy of FNAF 1 online. As so, I did what I was told and removed it. My mom supported me in every step. She then contacted Scott about the game not being a pirated copy and that it was a fan game I made from scratch using his assets as a way to teach myself how to use a click team game program. Seeing as, one, Tyler was using his characters and settings without his permission, and two, it was confusing customers that this was an official licensed FNAF game, as well as the fact that the third title was in the talks of being made anyways, and this would ultimately conflict with the advertisement and marketing of the real third installment. The page was removed, but then reposted as the Return to Freddy's instead. Now, I'm sure Tyler wasn't intentionally trying to infringe on others' copyright or get in the way of Scott's third game release. I mean, you have to remember that he was just a kid making a fan game. He was probably, like, imagining his own version of what a third installment would look like. Probably not thinking a third game would ever be made. But another copyright issue would come at the behest of another big name in the FNAF community. And that big name was Emil Mako. 
there was this huge unnecessary drama about the character I had used without permission in my experimental game. I was only 14 at the time and didn't know any better, and after removing the character and apologizing, I still have received massive amounts of death threats telling me to go kill myself and that I should have never existed to begin with, and that added on to the depression I already had at the time and it made it even worse. Emil Mako is a FNAF fan game developer and creator of the popular fan game Five Nights at Candy's. In this game's canon, Candy's Burgers and Fries is a sister location of sorts to Freddy Fazbear's Pizzeria and exists as another entertainment joint for Fazbear Entertainment. Candy the Cat is Emil Mako's Fazbear Sona, if you will, the lead character and mascot of Emil Mako. Candy the Cat makes an appearance in The Return to Freddy's. There's only a uh, one teeny tiny problem with this. Assets for Candy the Cat were stolen and put in the game without Emil Mako's permission. You see, at the time of The Return to Freddy's release, Five Nights at Candy's wasn't even a concept yet. Candy just existed as a fan character created by Emil. An actual game featuring the character wouldn't come out until July of the following year, 2015. Remember that the Return to Freddy's was released December 23rd, 2014, seven months before Five Nights at Candy's would launch. Emil Mako would post his creations as a 3D modeler and artist, and Candy just so happened to be one of those creations that he wanted to make into a full-fledged game at some point. That was until Tyler stole his design and put it into his own game. And people who had never heard of Emil Mako or were not familiar with his work confused this character as an original character for the game. Obviously upset that this character was being used without his permission, Emil requested its removal from the game entirely. He also just changed the name of the character to Sugar the Cat. I suppose to try to pass it off as his own character separate from Candy. Ultimately, Candy's render did get removed from the game with enough pushback, but it would be passed off later as Sugar the Cat in the following sequels, and this would be the original character for the Return to Freddy's going forward. But here's the craziest thing about this. The entire lore dump that I just gave you is ways more interesting in comparison to the actual game. Because the actual game fucking sucked. Okay, I guess it's finally time to review the game now. This game was created on the Games Factory 2 engine, and it's taken all the gameplay aspects of the first FNAF game and the second one and making it 10 times worse. Keep in mind, Tyler was a child when he designed this game, so obviously it's not gonna be a competent product. I think that's a given, but there is just... I don't mean to dog at a kid, but there's just so many problems. We start the game with this opening hallucination, I think. You're gonna hear me say, I think, I guess, and I don't know a lot, because I honestly don't think I know entirely what happened to this thing. Opening hallucination at the second Freddy Fazbear's location. And then we get a golden Freddy jump scare. Title card. We then have this excerpt from a newspaper that reads... And I quote, They're fixed. The ever so popular pizzeria animatronics have been fixed and repaired at last. They have also fixed and brought back everyone's favorite pirate fox, Foxy. The murderer of the four children and one missing child has yet to be found. They also brought back something from the old pizzeria. Something to bring back to the hopes and joys of children and grown-ups alike. But the building has yet to be cleaned. Not responsible for injury slash dismemberment. $150 a week to apply called 188-FAZ-FAZ-BEAR. Uh, don't try to call that number, by the way. I'm almost certain it'll probably get you, like, some sort of phone scam or something. So you get into the game and we are back at the very first Freddy Fazbear's Pizza location. Get it? Because it's called the Return to Freddy's? Ha 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 ha. So we get a phone call from the titular phone guy of the franchise. Most of the game was created entirely by Tyler by himself. So he himself plays this role in the game. And uh... I thought they... Well, well, he was after me. Probably not. Anyways, it's just my problems. Nothing, nothing you should worry about. So a child made this. If you're laughing right now, you're making fun of a child. 
I'm not making fun of a child because I'm not in church. So here's where we run into issues pretty much right away. For one, the doors don't actually do anything. There have been multiple updates and different versions of this game. Before, the doors were functional, but considering that the mask mechanism is also in this game, animatronics will get into your office whether the doors were open or not. In newer updates, the doors are permanently closed, but that doesn't keep the animatronics out, so the doors do absolutely nothing. Instead, you have to wear a mask to ward off any animatronics. But also, uh, the mask sometimes doesn't work either. The mask has a toxic meter that was an unused asset in Five Nights at Freddy's 2, but if I'm gonna be honest, I don't really know how it works. This game is, like I said before, both FNAF 1 and 2 game mechanics put into one game. But since the doors are permanently closed anyways, you don't really have to worry about preserving power when you keep the doors closed. The only thing now that drains your power is the monitors and the lights, uh, which drains your power like fucking crazy. I guess to uh, make up for and overcompensate for the fact that the doors are permanently closed, so that's not the thing that uses up all your power now. Not to mention that these nights go on for what feels like an eternity. Now, the last time we talked about a FNAF fan game, we briefly talked about how the games function through a concept called RNG, which means Random Numbers Generator. Well, as far as I've come to understand this, the Return to Freddy doesn't really work that way. Most walkthroughs that you'll see on YouTube will look the exact same, and that's because there is a set path and timing to when animatronics show up each and every time. This makes the games painfully easy. All of the jump scare deaths are just renders from Five Nights at Freddy's 2, except for two. Candy the Cat jump scare is just Bonnie's from FNAF 2 with Candy's face rendered on top, and Golden Freddy is just Freddy Fazbear's jump scare from the first game, except he's yellow. Also, the puppet is here for some reason, but I don't actually know how he functions. He does have a music box, but you don't actually need to wind it up or anything. I, for the most part, he just kind of roams around and doesn't really do anything. I mean, you're supposed to technically wear the mask when he's near your door, but sometimes even that doesn't work. So I'm just gonna assume that if he shows up, you're fucked. The point is, if there are any sort of enemies nearby, the only thing you theoretically need to do is just put on a mask and pray to God that it works. Also, I have to mention that when every night ends, it cuts back to the title screen instead of to the next night. Now, this doesn't seem like much of an issue considering I believe that the first FNAF demo also did this. The difference is, is that the games originally had you save the game on your menu new screen. So it had no autosave feature. I'm pretty sure that this was something that was removed in an update, but like, then why was that a thing? Every night ends with some sort of cutscene hallucination thing I don't actually know. And I'm not really sure what these are trying to say because it doesn't really tell you much of anything. Sometimes when you die, you get an opportunity to play death minigames that have become popularized by the second game. Except usually when you get a death minigame in Five Minutes at Freddy's 2, you get some hints to the original story. But here... You know what, don't even ask me to interpret anything from these because I gave up once I saw this game with Katie the Cat. Where Tyler, I guess to get another jab at Emil Mako, uh, names a sprite after him in this 8-bit minigame. Look, don't ask me, I don't know. So I guess the story here is that Vincent was the original employee from FNAF Y, I think? Except for that was Mike, Mike Schmidt. The only reason I believe this is what this is trying to tell me is because in one of the death mini games, the purple guy listens to the final night four phone call from FNAF 1. I don't know, I guess FNAF 2 happens at some point in this timeline, and then the return to Freddy's happens like later. And I'm only saying this is the order, even though canonically FNAF 2 is a prequel. I don't know, Tower doesn't really make any references to both locations like happening in different time zones, so I don't really know. The story isn't really made perfectly clear. I mean, the phone guy alludes that you, the player, and himself aren't even really supposed to be there. Also, something's chasing after the phone guy or whatever, I don't know. The original newspaper clipping from the first build of the game had random bolded lettering that would spell out 
I am here. And Phone Guy referencing a him coming after him could be in reference to this. This version of the newspaper clipping was later removed in updates, so it's not really clear as to who the Phone Guy is talking about. But it's not like leaving this in would have made this any more or less clear either way. The game was planned to have multiple remakes and remasters as well, but I'm not really interested in talking about those just yet. Considering that I just want to look into what Tyler made and his main lineup and story. So to continue Tyler's works, let's talk about... The Return to Freddy's 2 was Tyler's first attempt at making a fan game from the ground up. No more stolen assets, no more copyright infringement, just some good old 3D rendering, and learning how to make games in Click Team Fusion. So, The Return of Freddy's 2 is basically just a worse version of FNAF 2, but granted, Tyler had to actually try this time to avoid copyright issues. I guess he learned his lesson, and the lesson is that 3D modeling is hard, because... What the hell is that? This game is where we get introduced to Lockjaw, Tyler's original humanoid animatronic character. So this game went through a few alphas with stolen assets before becoming this to then becoming this. There is some character development with this, considering that the first two builds were gonna be just the same shit pulled off in the last game. That was until Tyler decided to learn 3D modeling. And hey, this game actually isn't as buggy as the last one. Other than the mask doesn't work sometimes again. But hey, we love it when someone aspires to at least try. But just because Tyler did try his hardest to make original content this time, the criticism from the past still lingered to haunt him. Such as the fact that Candy the Cat is still technically in this game series. Now, granted, Tyler did try his hand at making an original render and design this time around, but it's still just Candy the Cat that he's trying to sell off as this character called Sugar the Cat. And it's just a shitty copy of Emile's work. But that's not all. Tyler decided to double down in this and made not just one, but two new cat-like characters. Now we have this thing called Kitty Faz Cat. Kitty Faz Cat is interesting because she's not just a copied off version off of Sydney the Cat. Actually, I think that Kitty Faz Cat came before Sydney the Cat, I, I think. I mean, by the time of this game's full release, Five Nights at Candy's was still in development, but also, this character was created by Tyler's now ex-girlfriend. Funnily enough, uh, according to Tyler, Kitty Fazcat is his least favorite character. I wonder why. During Charity of 2's development, I met my first girlfriend that I would force myself into. It was me basically trying to feel accepted rather than just being myself and accepting myself. She had a character that she asked if she could make, and I did. I then asked if she wanted her OC to be in the game, and she said yes, of course. There's also this new character, Doug the Dog, which is probably a character that is in reference to Sparky the Dog, which is that fake Five Nights at Freddy's Easter egg character. Oddly enough, Doug would make a brief appearance in the next game following this, and then completely disappear from the franchise entirely. Now, this would lead some to believe that the Return to Freddy's series was some sort of satire of the original FNAF series. And it's also a satire of the Five Nights at Freddy's community as a whole. Not only is Tyler making reference to fan-created characters that are popularized by the fandom, including naming the phone guy after a popular Tumblr AU character, but also urban legends and myths regarding the community. Now, I could see why someone would find this to be a satire, I guess. But you also have to remember that by the time these games came out, Tyler was 14 and the word satire lost all of its meaning to its definition with Leafy is Here's popularity, so... And listen, I'm not even saying all this to be like an insult to Tyler's intelligence, but... I don't think he would have the wherewithal to make biting satire as a 14 year old. I mean, to be fair, you have to have a very high IQ to understand Five Nights at Funny. <laughs> so what's the story with this game? Well. It more so is just the same story as Five Nights at Freddy's 2. It's a prequel game, actually. So you're a character named... Consen... Cots? 
funny and original. So what makes this a prequel, Gabe, is the fact that this new restaurant we are in is Fredbear's Family Diner. The phone guy, whose name is Allison, is actually audible in this game, so you can actually understand what the hell he's saying. Character development. Uh, hello? Hello? Uh, hello and welcome to your new summer job. I hear to talk to you some of the things that you could expect to see in your first week here and help you start this new and exciting career path. He explains on the first night the mechanics of the game, which are essentially the same as FNAF 2 mechanics except the mask is still toxic. You have a music box to maintain and a generator that needs to be maintained the same way the music box does. It's literally just FNAF 2 with two extra mechanics. The toxic meter and this generator thing that preserves power to the entire building. Other than that, there are no doors, the music box mechanism is there, vents are in this game, and we had the mask to put on. It's literally FNAF 2 with extra steps. <laughs> Here's the funniest part though. The music box is a new installment to the building according to the phone guy for the gift giving animatronics. But I guess some kid broke the animatronics so it's not even in the room with the music box. And you would think it's talking about the puppet but I'm all certain that it's not. I am pretty sure that Allison is talking about like Kitty Faz Cat or Sugar. But the puppet still responds to the music box anyways, so what was even the point in explaining that? There are death mini games in this, but once again, just like the last Return to Freddy's, they actually don't tell you very much. Most of these are just walking simulations where you either are following a certain shadowy figure or the puppet, but when it's not either one of those two things, it's just a FNAF 2 death mini game rehashed. The only thing that these death mini games tell us is that there is a sprite in the games that kind of looks like the new addition to this series, which is the Lockjaw animatronic. Lockjaw is Tyler's favorite animatronic. You can tell it's his favorite because not only does he get multiple appearances from this point onwards, but also in this sprite that is featured in the death mini games that resembles Lockjaw is a child character named BFP. <laughs> So this fedora hat wearing child character is a self insert for Tyler and this self insert child character will make a reappearance later but just know that they're a self insert that is important to the story and is also somehow related to Lockjaw and I'll explain how he is later. Anyways, Lockjaw has a glitch in his matrix or some shit that makes the animatronics turn into killing robots or something. And if that really explained why he has the ability or the effect to do this on other animatronics, or why he's even in this building. So, Lockjaw, I think, is the reason why the animatronics think that adults are just, like, human endoskeletons that need to be stuffed into the suits. And that's essentially what Lockjaw's glitch is and why the animatronics start acting up around adults is because of him. The game ends with the animatronics going all spooky silly and kids go missing and then they're dying and that's the, that's the end. That's it, the end. So I guess this game is supposed to give us some sort of explanation on how we ended up the way that we are at in The Return to Freddy's 1. But because I don't know what the fuck was going on in Return to Freddy's 1, I can't tell you what the fuck any of this was supposed to be. I guess this is supposed to take place around the time that kids start going missing at Fredbear's. Wait, did, kid, did kids go missing at Fredbear's? I don't remember, it's been a while. Well, hopefully this shit starts making more sense soon because so far I am completely lost. <laughs> This is probably one of the more better games in the series, and I say that because by this point, there's a lot of improvement. Like, for instance, uh, mechanics actually work the way they should in this game. Fucking finally, the textures actually look nice with the 3D models. The gameplay is, you know, definitely unoriginal. I mean, it's just like FNAF 3, but... I don't think it's all that terrible, especially since there are some ideas in here. I mean, you still have to watch over animatronics with only one door and a monitor with a toggle map and maintenance panel. But you could also corrupt animatronic signals or close off the main door to your office. This game, just like FNAF 3, has two endings. The bad ending, of course, is achieved by just playing the base game all the way through, and the good ending is achieved by clicking on posters in your office. 
that brings you to secret mini games. Now these mini games actually do tell us something about the lore this time instead of just being there for the sake of being there. You also have to type some code on your keyboard that honestly I had to google because there's nothing in the game that would indicate this at all. Now, granted, I don't think that the way you get these secret minigames is as complicated as they were in FNAF 3, but the new issue here is that there are so many of them that you have to play through just to get the good ending. Like, you have to click on posters, but at the same time, there's all of these other minigames that you have to play, and also the death minigames too, that tell you even more lore. It's just like, it's too much stuff, not, not enough, enough space. space. Okay, so this is what I could figure out with what the story of this game is, and I'm at this point just making an educated guess, because to be completely honest, I don't know. This whole thing doesn't make any goddamn sense, but anyways. You play as Blake. You and your two friends, Wilson and Chun, are turning this abandoned restaurant into a new attraction site called Fazbear Fantasyland, which is clearly a reference to this fake teaser trailer that alludes that FNAF 4 was going to be taking place at some sort of amusement park. A new entertainment is close to opening its doors and reveal the legend from the past. They only have a few more things to salvage before it officially opens. The new entertainment is called Fazbear Fantasy Land. It's kind of hard to figure out what exactly the goal is for these characters, considering that one of the friends that acts as like a second phone guy in this game is so goddamn quiet that any lore that you can get from him is just completely missing because you have no idea what the hell he's saying. Hey Blake, we just discovered a very dark secret about Frank Bird's pizza. Oh. We had him murder up to four children and one missing Chinese people came in. First Frank Bird's and Frank Bird's family died And it's very interesting. His last name is Fred Smith. Uh, I don't think his, that's his name though. So, in the bad ending of the game, you play as Vincent and you scare a child to hide inside a lockjaw. So I'm assuming that when Vincent, who is the phone guy in the first game if you remember, uh, is referring to being chased by him, right? And I'm assuming that this him is the child that he forced into the lockjaw suit, I think. Sure, yeah, fucking. Also, the child who was killed in the lockjaw suit is the same BFP character from the death minigames in the last game. So it's fair to assume that Tyler's self-insert dying in an animatronic that also looks like said self-insert is also, also, a self-insert for Tyler. Do you, do you understand why Lockjaw is his favorite animatronic now? Yeah, it's because it's basically himself. The glitch mentioned by Allison in the last game that made the animatronics think that adults were endoskeletons was just a possessed Lockjaw corrupting the animatronics to do his bidding. Basically, the entire story of The Return to Freddy's is Tyler's self-insert dying inside of an animatronic self-insert and being the cause of everything that happens in the original FNAF series. And that's it. Lockjaw goes on a killing rampage and kills more children, and I guess the government wants to outlaw animatronics because of Lockjaw. I'm not kidding, that's how the game ends. Oh, and Candy the Cat is destroyed now and gets completely replaced by a snake. So this is the final game of the franchise that Tyler would actually complete. There is, canonically, according to the Return to Freddy's wiki, five installments. But we'll get to the Return to Freddy's 5 later because that is a mess. <laughs> so the Return to Freddy's 4 takes place after the demolishment of Fazbear Fantasyland. Since then, for 15 years, the government has outlawed all form of animatronic until now. Uh-huh. So this game has the same plot as the last game, which is Blake and his friends trying to start up Fazbear Fantasyland again. Only this time we have a new phone guy with you besides Wilson and Chun, and this new character is named John. Now, before, in each game, alongside with Lockjaw, there was always the company for mainline animatronics. But now, Freddy and Bonnie are the only mainline group that is left, and Chica and Foxy have been completely replaced with Kitty Fastcat returning, 
and some other characters that I don't really care for. You still have to watch animatronics through your monitors and still get phone calls throughout the nights. The only thing that makes this fourth installment different from the last game is that you have to hide in a locker when animatronics try to come into your office. The locker doesn't work for Lockjaw and Freddy though as you have to pull a smoke lever to scare them off. Other than that, the gameplay is kind of meh. In comparison, I mean, you don't really have a ton of mechanics to make it a challenge. And the monitor isn't even something you have to flip upwards. You just look over and it's right next to the door. Story-wise, this game is a bit more straightforward. You have many games that show Vincent going on his killing spree, basically doing like purple guy bullshit. And on night five, we go into a storage room and find... I'm sorry, who the fuck is that? Okay, so this is Gron. Say hi to Gron. So, Gron was a secret character that was eluded all the way back in the Return to Freddy's 3. And I only mention him now because I didn't think he'd be an actual character. And now I just feel silly. So, I couldn't really interpret what the hell was going on with this. So, I'm just going to read the wiki here and see what the fuck this was and what that has to say about this. In the Night 5 minigame where you play as Vincent, he appears in a room with a hallucination of his younger self and the Golden Lockjaw suit at the opposite end of the room. Gron is standing in front of him, smiling, and then walk towards the middle of the room, most likely to meet with Vincent. Though a white object is in the middle, which causes him to slip inside of the Golden Lockjaw suit. He then looks around for a few moments before getting crushed by it and blood pouring out of it and shaking. Huh? Okay, so I guess this is getting retconned because this hallucination of Gron's younger self is the BFP character insert? So, I guess BFP isn't Lockjaw. BFP is Gron, I think? And he slips on like this one singular pixel on the floor. I guess this is supposed to be a bar of soap or some shit. And he falls into the golden lockjaw suit and is crushed to death. What the fuck? Look, I I know that my audience wanted me to review this series after my door made this video. Look, I make one offhanded remark about it. I say, yeah, maybe I'll talk about it in the future. But then everyone wanted me to talk about it actually for real. So here I am, and I just need to ask... Why? What did I do to deserve to deserve all of this? Am I just a monkey with symbols? Is that all I am to you? Am I just a wind-up toy from Toy Story 3 just to entertain you? Because I am not. I am human and I have the right to say what the fuck was that? Anyways, so that's it, sort of. And I say sort of because we haven't even gotten into the drama and developmental hell that happens afterwards. It's a series of events that involve several remasters, games and updates being cancelled, a bunch of unrelated projects, a strip club installment, and a book. Strap in folks because it's about to get so much crazier. <laughs> The Return to Freddy's 5 was a planned sequel for the Return to Freddy's series. The idea for another sequel came to be after Tyler planned to reboot the entire series. The first four games of the Return to Freddy's series are all categorized as Volume 1. Tyler created everything that has to do with Volume 1 of the series. Volume 2, or The Next Timeline, are all games that were scrapped and for the most part are made without Tyler's direct involvement. Instead, he kind of plays like second fiddle to the other developers. So... Where to even start? The Return to Freddy's 5 was a concept conceived after Tyler wanted to reboot the whole series, with the Return to Freddy's remastered. The only thing that really is left of this project is a banner poster with Shadow Lockjaw's old design from TRTF2. After the cancellation of a remaster, Tyler released two demos for the Return to Freddy's rebooted, which featured many games that explained the new rebooted story. Now, I would go over this, but this stuff is better explained in the book so i'll just wait until we get to that section to explain what was going on here because it's 
nuts. So during this time, the rights for the series had been handed around to several other game developers, tasked by Tyler to reboot the series. The idea to reboot the whole series was then also scrapped in favor of completing a sequel to the mainline set of games. The Return to Freddy's 5 was planned to have multiple modes, including a story mode, an adventure mode, which is essentially just a FNAF world ripoff, and a cooperative mode called The Return to Freddy's Online. Around the time that this game was in development, Tyler would transfer ownership of the franchise to multiple different people. The first being someone named Yin Koyu. However, this Yin Koyu character was revealed to be one of Tyler's alternative accounts. So, for whatever reason, Tyler just transferred the rights to his own series to himself. <laughs> the decision to do this never ceases to amaze me. So after that fake out franchise transfer, in October of 2016, Tyler did give TRTF to an actual person this time. Two people, actually. Tanner Feline and Toonster. Both of which were developers and game modelers themselves who had helped Tyler in the past with past games. However, both creators would have major disagreements with the direction of the game. Toonster wanted to completely change the lore of the games, which Tanner didn't want to do. Toonster ultimately was the one to axe the project entirely, and the two would try to make their own versions of the Return to Freddy's 5. Toonster would actually make make a demo and a spin-off game for the Return to Freddy series called Red Slaw. Two demos do exist, but the project was canceled back in 2019. So what's funny about all of this is that there is a petition that was created by Toonster to get the rights back for TRTF back in 2018. Shocker uh, to no one, uh, he didn't get the rights back. I guess it was because he only got like 67 signatures or some shit. Someone named BioNinja Games, whose real name is Jason Paulini, was given the rights to the Return to Freddy series in late 2016. Before being given the keys to the kingdom, Tyler and Jason actually worked together on a spin-off project that would have been released alongside with Toonster's Radsla game. Back in 2015, the Return to Freddy's Freakbert was in the works with both Tyler and Jason being behind the project. There was planned to be a set amount of like movement or free room in the office space you were in. It was going to be a seven night structure where the final two nights act as bonus nights. And the seventh night was basically just a challenge mode where all the animatronics would have had their AIs automatically set to the highest settings. Now, unlike the Return to Freddy's 5 or Ratsaw, Frank Burt was looking like it was gonna actually come out and be finished. Tyler was promoting the game on his Twitter. He was also alluding to cryptic lore that Frank Burt was the canonical name of the Lockjaw animatronic. Now, a reconstructed build of the final game does exist with some established lore for this spinoff. And, um... <laughs> okay, so... Do you guys remember that, like, fake fan theory that was made by the community that the uh, sister location and animatronics were actually made for adult entertainment? <laughs> Well, that's, that's what Frank Burtz is. Frank Burtz is an adult entertainment company where the animatronics are used for special entertainment. From December of 2016 to February 6, 2017, Paulini owned the rights to the entire TRTF brand. He removed himself from the franchise after canceling his plans to make the fifth installment and Frank Burtz and stepped down from the series entirely. At some point during his reign as the head of the franchise, he actually removed all of the Return to Freddy's games from Game Jolt, which prompted Tyler to announce that the series was coming to an end. Now, during this turbulent period of spin-offs getting canceled, reboots for other games getting canceled, and three developers dropping out, we did get a couple of builds for the Return to Freddy's 5. These builds would introduce us to a couple of different animatronic designs. The first were called the Torture Animatronics, which get referenced in the book, so we're going to talk about them when we get to the book. And there were also the Hybrid Animatronics that were made for the first builds of the game. And they look like ass. The main villain of the final builds of the Alphas is an animatronic that is probably the most recognizable character related to the Return to Freddy series. I mean, it's in the thumbnail of this video. It's in the thumbnail of everybody's videos about this. And that is the tortured lockjaw animatronic. And that's what's like so interesting about this is that the most recognizable animatronic model that is in association with this series isn't even a model that comes from the completed games in 
the series, it's a design that was part of a project that has been picked up, dropped, picked up, renamed, dropped, picked up, rebranded, dropped, and then canceled indefinitely. So I think that covers everything correctly, I think. This whole like developmental hell section was so hard to figure out, like timeline wise, what the fuck was going on. Because none of these people, as far as I know, are online anymore. And also the wiki is confusing as shit. But now that I finally got through all of that, I can finally talk about my favorite part of this series. My favorite thing to come out of this. And that's the Fun Nights at Freddy's. That's where I wanna be. Fun Nights at Freddy's. The Return to Freddy's, The Dreadful Truth, is the definite works of Tyler Alstrom finally explaining what the hell the story of this franchise was supposed to be. Because Tyler was so bad at explaining his story in his own games, he decided to make a book. Hey, just like in Scott Cawthon. Anyone who knows anything about this series knows that the book is infamous for retconning a lot of what happens in the original games. The soap slipping accident with Gron is completely changed. BFP is explained to be Gron's younger self, even though the alpha build for TRTF5 tried to change this to BFP being Gron's son? And it changed back to like a hallucination, I guess. Also, if BFP is a hallucination of Gron, then does that mean that Gron died first and then Vincent killed his younger self hallucination? Where it, it doesn't matter. But the best part of the plot of this story I shit you not, I did not make this up, I couldn't make this up even if I tried, is that the animatronics were built as a cure to fight against super cancer. What the hell? Well, we have arrived. <laughs> we have finally made it to the clickbait in the thumbnail. How's everyone doing? <laughs> no. Listen, yes. I know I come across as this big know-it-all who creates these heavily researched, long-winded, crazy edited videos for this stupid little hell site that we call YouTube.com. And because it comes with the territory, I tend to present myself as someone who is very knowledgeable and has the answers to absolutely everything. I got nothing for that. It's just... It... Super cancer. Uh-huh. I mean, I'm really not sure what kind of explanation that y'all want from me at this point because... I got nothing. The best thing I can do for you right now is just explain what happens in this book. And oh my god. You don't understand Mark like I do, man. That dude was twerking on the showroom dance floor like a maniac. So back in 1942, a secret Japanese military base called the Gilbert Facility was fighting against a super contagious form of cancer called... Super Cancer. Oh my god. Their solutions for those affected was to transfer their souls into the bodies of... robots. Evon... Genesis Evangelion. I have not seen that show, so that's a... It's probably not what happens in the show. It's not a good reference, I'm sorry. So they start up the cryptocurrency scam Save the Kids token and started putting kids' souls into the robots. Three volunteers, referred to as Patient 20, Patient 48, and Patient 63, were the first to test these chambers that were made to transfer souls into inanimate robots. And these tests were successful, and their new robot bodies were called the... Fairy Tale Animatronics. So the Make-A-Wish kids were given the names Fairy Tale Ty, Fairy Tale Collie, and Fairy Tale Sally. Collie and Sally are the names of animatronics in the Return to Freddy's 4, so I guess they're here too. So during the experiments, I guess the scientists regret what they started working on, and so they made an antidote for the patients in the robot suits. I I think. So they rushed out this antidote faster than the COVID vaccine. That was a joke, by the way. That was a joke. Um, anti-vaxxers can kiss my uh, needle-poked ass. And they called this new antidote Code Radslaw. Well, it's almost like they were going to make a game about that or something. In 1943, the owner of the Gilbert facility was sick and dying. And their son, who is named Alei... 
I think is how you say that, decided in order to save his father's soul that he would need to use the soul transfer to put his dad into an animatronic. This too was also successful, but we never hear about this like animatronic that his dad was placed in and I guess he just ceases to be a character. So word got to the American government of this amazing soul transfer machine and the investors are asking about bringing this thing to America. However, the sales rep they must have hired must have been really bad in his job because Ale just kind of hangs up with him and is all like, no, fuck off. Well, it turns out that the person he just hung up on was Allison, the phone guy from the second TRTF2 game. Well, it turns out he is the head of an American mafia drug gang character development. So he puts on his Riz, which is described as a red trench coat, blue jeans, and a white fedora. My man is really decked out here in so much Riz. And he tells his men, pack up, we're going to Japan. Are you challenging me? Uh oh, too late. So the gang shows up in Japan to find the Gilbert facility. Allison calls Ale up ahead of time and says he's gonna show up to his crib and bust a cap in his ass. So the gang attacks the facility and I, I don't actually know what the fuck happens at this point, but the story is told throughout in this narrative writing structure. So it's not told in the perspective of any of the characters. It's more so a narrator that is like telling the audience what's happening. That is until the narrator becomes a character in the story. I guess like the narrator was actually Allison, I think. So they invade the whole facility and everyone dies. Allison finds the Radsla antidote for the soul machine and drinks half of it. I don't know why, since he doesn't know what the hell this stuff is and he's only here for the machine. Allison is just so crazy and evil that he just starts drinking random chemicals. Side effects of this uh, Radsla stuff includes a sore throat, and a headache, which is what I have right now. Now, these are normal side effects that aren't too bad. Now, this stuff does cut off your sperm count, but you know what? It's totally fine because a slight head cold and a lack of cum chalice is totally worth it for 90% immortality. I mean, is it really like true mortality if you only get like 90% of it? Also, what does 90% immortality mean? What, what would that even entail like what what does that mean so now that the gang has the machine and the male birth control they can now start working on their ultimate plan start a pizzeria joint i am not kidding freddy fazbear's pizzeria and fazbear inc has its origins in gang violence the reason why they would make a pizzeria is because it was easy money Look at people you have a machine that puts the dying human consciousness into robot bodies and also the immortality chug jug. Just fucking sell that shit. Patent it. Sell it. Make more of the immortality lean. This is a PSA that Lazy Bedhead does not condone the usage of lean. Why did I write that? <laughs> so the gang opens up their first restaurant with a golden bear and bunny animatronic. Now, I know what you're thinking at this point. Oh, this must be Fred Bear's family diner. And no, it's a restaurant called a Goldie's Paradiner. Just keep going. So yeah, Allison in this universe is the creator of the original Springlock suits, I guess. So one day, a man named Gron, you know, Gron, the homie. So Gron starts working at Fazbear Inc. as a jester, I guess, which is why he looks like that. And he has a wife and two kids. And I guess even though he looks like this, he's a normal man with family values. <laughs> Eventually, Gron brings along his laid-back family friend named Vincent, and they both start working for the company at Goldie's. So Mortagron and Vinceby start slacking off on the job, and... Benson <laughs> decides that he wants to make an example out of the slackers. And this is where we're introduced to the torture animatronics, who only exist because Allison built them to torture slackers in his company, I guess. <laughs> just, just, just roll with it at this point. Fazbear Inc. is using slave labor and torturing people and killing them with the animatronic suits secretly. So what exactly are the torture animatronics and what exactly do they do? So what they do is they trap a person inside of the robot, kind of like the spring lock uh, animatronic suits. The only difference is, is that there's like tiny little knives that sprout out and they stab and drain the person inside to death.
We get another weird moment where the narrator becomes a character again. I don't know if this is like Gron or Vincent magically becoming the narrator this time. Like literally it goes like, well, Vincent and Gron were starting to get a little suspicious of their boss. And then I started snooping around his office and I'm just like, bitch, who the fuck is I? So Gron and Vincent find the torture room that is torturing and enslaving their past co-workers that they thought were fired, but it turns out that they're being put in these death suits or something. Oh, and they also like worship the death suits like a god, so I guess it's also like a cult. <laughs> just keep just keep throwing everything and anything at the wall and hope it sticks. They find this machine that's been creating these torture animatronics and they decide to destroy it so it can't make any more murder robots. But as it turns out, they actually didn't destroy the machine and only made the AI worse. I guess they just awoken the machine and it's like maybe sentience or something. I don't I don't know. You know, in a different story, this would just be the start of I have no mouth and I must scream. <laughs> They're discovered by Allison and the gang and attempt to escape. They barricade the exit and left, but I'm confused as to whether or not Vincent and Gron leave their jobs at this point, and I'll, I'll explain what I mean here in like just a little bit. In November of 1943, they start making spring lock suits, and at this point, I'm reading all of these dates, right? And I'm just kind of wondering, you know, how, how's the war going? Like, there, there's a war going on in this time frame. A major war. I don't know if you've uh, heard of it. It's 1943. The bombs haven't been dropped yet. Hitler's still alive. And for whatever reason, I'm reading about a mafia boss creating Fazbear Entertainment, even though technology wouldn't have been advanced enough for animatronics to even exist then. And around this time is when a familiar character is finally built. A golden lockjaw suit named Frank Burt. Oh, you see, you see how it's, you see how it's all connected now? And for whatever reason, they also built a golden kitty faz cat suit that's never mentioned in the games ever? I I'm not really sure why Tyler keeps including his ex-girlfriend's Fazbear Sona, I don't know. So I failed to explain this before, but Fazbear Inc. is more so like a corporate entity that has like this corporate building, and they exist to build and rent out their animatronics. So at some point in the story, there's these three other employees that show up and they're all like snooping around this giant corporate building and they find these three animatronic suits. When Allison finds out about this, they intentionally put themselves in the suits and try to fight off against their boss. But oh no, they're stuck and they can't get out. And I'm just gonna read a passage from this, some dialogue if you will, um, to give you an idea of the sense of urgency that's happening in this scene because it's it's very intense, let me tell you. You dumbasses. When a person enters these torture suits, it automatically deploys torture mode, meaning you're not getting out. See this button here? I'm gonna press it and I'm gonna watch as you die and scream my name. I'll watch as your family loses you and wonders why you never came home for a warm meal. I'll watch as your family wonders why you never came back home to say goodnight to your children. Goodbye, fools. It was a shame it had to come to this. You know, Jigsaw would be proud. <laughs> Wait, hold up. Now that I'm thinking about it, Allison is literally just the jigsaw killer. I mean, he makes these elaborate mechanisms that are used to kill people. The only difference is that the traps are just animatronic torture suits and, and that's it. So for whatever godforsaken reason, a month later, Gron takes his wife and two kids to Goldie's Paradina. Even though he used to work for this company and his ex-boss almost attempted to kill them, but he's gonna bring his whole family to this restaurant that I guess it's implied that he still works there. But I, I figured after what Vincent and him saw that they would have quit. I, d I don't know. But before they could leave the restaurant, they get into some sort of car crash in the parking lot. So the family are all in the hospital and Gron is recovering from his injuries, but oh no, the gang is back and they're ready for revenge. So I guess it turns out that Allison was the one that caused the car crash because he was worried that Gron was trying to take down his business, even though that's not what he was doing at all. So he tries to kill Gron and his family, but they recover in the hospital because... He just, you know, crashed their car in the middle of a parking lot. So, like, 911 was called pretty much immediately by, like, a bunch of witnesses. But Alice wants Gron, like, out of the picture. So he hires a hitman to kill Gron's wife whilst she is in a coma in the hospital. <laughs> so after his wife was killed and Gron is stable enough to walk around out of his hospital bed, the doctors, for whatever reason, tell Gron 
that they have to put his youngest son into foster care? It's not really explained why they have the authority to do this. I guess it's because of the hitmen because they say, well, it's for your son's safety. But there's no indication that the doctors know about that. There's nothing alluding that the hospital knows that a hitman just killed her. They just put one son in foster care for whatever reason, but Gron gets to keep his other kid because he's old enough to make his own decisions. So I guess he's like 18 or something? Also, there's no reason to separate the two kids because as far as the hospital is concerned, the family got into a car crash where it was the other driver who intentionally ran into them. But none of this actually matters because for whatever reason, Gron decides to leave his other son and he starts like hearing voices and having PTSD hallucinations or some shit. I'm sorry, wait a damn minute. So even though you and your kids are alive and you decided to leave your oldest son alone with a note saying that you're gonna, I don't know, get some milk or some shit, you leave him be with no means of taking care of himself and he's also a paranoid schizophrenic? Kron is a terrible father. Oh, you think you can handle it? No. Okay. Oh. Keep all this in mind too, by the way. If it feels like these chapters have like a ton of shit that happens in them all at once, uh, that's because it, it does happen that way and it goes on for eternity and they get so much longer as the book goes on. So Gron and Vincent reunite and go back to Goldie's for whatever reason, even though, again, this restaurant is owned by their ex-employer that literally just tried to kill Gron and murdered his wife. But they get some drinks at Goldie's and Gron starts hallucinating his younger self and has some sort of like PTSD flashback because again, his whole family literally was destroyed within this parking lot like a day ago. So Gron keeps seeing this kid in a fedora and he's hearing this voice over and over say, a prophecy. And he remembers the golden lockjaw and kitty fast cat suits that are back at the warehouse where she and Vincent used to work. And he's like, I know what must be done. So he goes to this warehouse and he decides that he's going to use the golden lockjaw suit to game end himself. Basically, after having hallucinations and being manic for like a day or something, <laughs> Vincent sees this happen and tries to save his friend, but he is too late. Or is he? Because then the Golden Lockjaw suit rises up and is alive, actually. And Golden Lockjaw tries to kill Vincent and the other employees at this warehouse. They just lock him away in the storage container so that he wouldn't be able to escape and hurt people. And I guess Vincent and Gron are still employed by Fazbear Inc. Because this boss character that shows up addresses Vincent like he still works there? Even though he ran away after seeing Allison killing people with Gron in the first chapter, I I don't know anymore. So Vincent goes to Gron's house to find the eldest son who Gron left behind, and he finds his dead body after he self ends. So Goldie's Paradiner eventually shuts down after the police start investigating the missing employees and the car crash that happened outside of the restaurant. And you know, that whole family dying was really suspicious and so convenient. So only now does anyone start looking into the company. <laughs> February 1944. The war was still going on, but that doesn't really matter because Frank Burt's Pizza opens in place of Goldie's. You know what I feel like at this point? I feel like that one uh, meme from that one Mr. Enter video. This book takes place in the years World War II was happening. I bring this up because it radically, radically altered, altered the, the culture, culture at the time. time. <laughs> the original owners of Goldie's wanted to redesign the Golden Kitty Fazcat and Frankbert, which is how we get the normal lockjaw in Kitty Fazcat animatronics in the games. Unfortunately, due to the fact that Fazbear Inc. is probably like an evil mafia torture company or some shit, Frankbert shuts down in like a month. Meanwhile, during the everything that we just went over, the Gilbert facility is still somehow working on their Save the Kids cryptocurrency, despite the fact that the Fazbear Mafia sent them to the gas chambers in the first episode. What remains of the Gilbert facility is trying to revive Ale, the CEO who was game ended in the first chapter. So they work on Ale for months until they were able to turn him into like this human robot hybrid thing. However, the moment that Ale is awake, he starts trying to kill everyone. Man, it almost seems like every time people are like resurrected through like machinery, they immediately turn violent. Maybe we should stop that. And then at some point we get a FNAF plot where a night guard is 
hired for the Gilbert facility and his name is Lloyd and he's here to look over the animatronics at night and to make sure that Ale, the robot monster man, uh, stays contained in this chamber that they've trapped him in so that he doesn't fucking get violent and hurt people. Also, the fairy tale animatronics from the first chapter are in the building too. Yeah, you know, the first successful robot storing the souls of the dead patients that we haven't seen since like the first chapter? Yeah, they're here apparently. And honestly, I don't know what the hell they've been up to this whole time. Actually, you know what? Scratch that. I don't know what the fuck they were doing when Allison started game-ending people. They just disappear for a couple of years, I guess. So this section of the chapter is basically like Five Nights at Gilbert's, where Lloyd is fighting for his life against the fairy tale robots and Ale. Gregory, how about you stop climbing inside of me and start climbing inside some bitches? So Allison wants to shut down the Gilbert facility, even though he tried to do that mass murder thing in chapter one, but I guess he didn't get rid of them entirely or something. I don't know, maybe you should have blown them up or some shit, Allison. <laughs> Come on, dude, really? <laughs> Chew. So it turns out that the animatronics trying to kill Lloyd, well, they're only now getting quirky at night because Allison was trying to hack them from... America. <laughs> Just assume that anytime anything bad happens in this series, it's because of Allison, okay? He's behind it somehow. Does the explanation of how he's behind it makes any fucking sense? No, but just go with it. Lloyd and Patient 20 can actually talk to each other at some point. Just, we're almost there, keep going. But Patient 20 is being possessed or packed by Allison or something and is currently in kill mode, I guess. <laughs> After trying to hack the other animatronics, Allison releases Ale from his confinement and he hunts down Lloyd. So to escape Ale, Lloyd shuts the emergency doors and goes through an emergency exit and runs off to this underground train thing at the Gilbert facility. So I guess he takes this Meglev train thing and it takes him to some different supply room in the facility where he chooses to hide out there instead. In the supply room, Lloyd thinks to himself, I can live to be a hero or die long enough to become the villain. And if you think I'm joking about that, I'm not. It's like kind of sort of the wording exactly, actually. So in a series of events that doesn't really matter, Ale kills Lloyd and then Lloyd magically is alive again and kills Ale in some sort of propane explosion that destroys the entire facility including the fairy tale animatronics. Now, I would talk about like the last few chapters of the book, but it's basically all of the lore from the Return to Freddy series, you know, with Allison opening the Fazbear Family Diner and Vincent killing the BPF child or whatever, and the golden and the lockjaw incident happens, and then there's Blake with his friends, they try to open Fazbear Haha -ha Funland, but then the lockjaw suit kills six kids and then outlaws a bunch of animatronics for 15 years and then they try to reopen it and then Blake fucking dies I guess. <laughs> so I'm not gonna rehash all of that. That's like literally the next three chapters. <laughs> the only new lore thing that is sort of significant from the novels is in the last chapters. So Blake dies from the golden lockjaw suit or Gron because I guess the spirit of Gron inside the golden lockjaw suit thought that Blake was Allison. And in the very last chapter this n this guy named Carson who I I guess was a part of like the adopted family of Grom's youngest son. He's a totally new character who is just brought up out of nowhere. I don't know. So Carson becomes like a private investigator and starts investigating uh, Frank Burt's entertainment, the, the adult entertainment story. Yeah, that, that happens in this book. They become adult entertainment a animatronics in this book. I'm losing my mind. I'm so <laughs> So Carson kills Allison at Frank Burt's and that's the canon now, I guess. And that's the end of the novel. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> you know, it's pretty embarrassing that somehow any of these books have more narrative consistency than this book does. Wait, where did these come from? So... This has been fun. The Return to Freddy's is criticized a lot online, and so is Tyler to an extent, and is often kind of swept under the rug and disregarded as a FNAF ripoff and a giant ploy for content theft. And 
If I'm gonna play devil's advocate here for just a second, I'd say that the return to Freddy is as stupid and as crazy and nonsensical as it is. I think it deserves a little more credit. The series is one of, if not the very first FNAF fan game series to ever exist. I mean, it outlives candies, Pop Goes, Flop Dees, and The Joy of Creation. This is probably one of the first FNAF fan verses to ever exist. And it was one of the very first fan games to get the attention of Scott Cawthon himself. I mean, it wasn't good attention, but still. Did Tyler make mistakes? Yes. He did steal content and was called out for that. He called Emil Mako some horrible things and put him in his game out of spite. He did steal Candy the Cat. He did steal people's fan renders of characters from Five Nights at Freddy's, and he did steal Scott's copyright when he tried to pass this off as the third installment of the franchise. And maybe he did lie about dating his sister or something. Wait a minute, huh? What the f- Who wrote that in the script? What the- What the fuck is this Reddit post? What the hell is fucking r slash Reddit circle jerk? Who wrote this? What are you talking about? As we all know, uh, Reddit is known for its integrity. And totally, nobody lies on there or anything. <laughs> but yeah, I feel like as a kid, Tyler probably got way more flack than what was deserved. I mean, he was just 14 years old when he made the first TRTF game. And when he got backlash for stealing, not only did he learn a new game development software, but also 3D rendering and modeling. I'd say that is leagues above someone like Urban Slug, who, if you forgot or haven't seen my first video for October, which you should totally watch, whatever he was criticized for his works, he would respond, um, like this. So you got to love some character development from Tyler. And like, sure, I'm sure that FNAF fan games and clones did exist after the first Five Nights at Freddy's came out, but none of those stand the test of time as famously or infamously as the Return to Freddy's does. So Tyler, if you're watching this, um, Thank you. I hope you're mentally doing well again. Even if you don't like the current state of the FNAF fandom now, you're a big reason as to why the fanverse exists at all. And I think you deserve more credit for that. If you watched this all the way to the very end, uh, thank you for supporting everything I do here. But also, fuck you. I make one offhanded joke about this series in my Dormitibus video. That video blows up. Y'all would not shut up about it in my comments. And now I'm here and I am talking about this shitty fan series instead of watching the FNAF movie. Now, theoretically, could I have just ignored all of you and just enjoyed the funny bear movie instead? Yes. But also, no, because I'm a massive attention whore. I mean, did you see how well that video did? The views, man, are just finger licking good. That was gross. I don't know why I did that. Now, in reality, that shouldn't really mean all that much because this is the internet and nothing is real. But it made me money, and that was real. And speaking of money, uh, give me your money. <laughs> that would be great. Anyways, that's gonna be it for me. I've been, oh uh, yeah, and I'll see you guys next time. Whoa.